<laughs> I have to admit, I have a, a fairly acute case of imposter syndrome sitting here. Um, I guess I have two big wishes. The first is that everyone laughs at the spots where they're supposed to and doesn't laugh at the spots where I'm being serious. <laughs> and the second is that the Holy Spirit will be with me, especially to, to bring to remembrance um, the things which I've prepared. Um, if you're watching online, um, just let me know in the comments if there's anything wrong with the audio. And that's supposed to be kind of funny. If you can't hear me, let me know. Um, okay. The great philosopher, Jeff Foxworthy, <laughs> is well known for his redneck jokes. Now, if you don't know what a redneck is, I don't blame you. I didn't know when he first burst on the scene. But according to Brother Foxworthy, if your wife has ever said, get in here and remove that transmission so I can take a bath, you might be a redneck. You might be a redneck if your kids bring a siphon hose to show and tell at school. <laughs> Again, according to Brother Foxworthy, you might be a redneck if you've been asked to show your ID and you show them your belt buckle. <laughs> there may be a little Photoshop involved in that image. This is where I grew up. It's a very rural place in Alaska. I never saw a traffic light until I was 18 years old and went to Seattle. So I really had no idea what a redneck was. It just was outside of my scope. So people had to explain it to me when Jeff Foxworthy became popular. Rednecks? I have no idea. However, as a convert to the church and a person trying to walk the covenant path, I had a pretty clear idea what a stiff neck was and very much wanted to not have a stiff neck. Now, if we look at the dictionary, a stiff neck is defined as a person who is haughty or stubborn. And uh, for my students out there, Kelly Trent, this word haughty is spelled H-A-U-G-H-T-Y, not H-O-T-T-I-E. I'm sorry we won't be talking about that tonight. That's some other speaker, <clears throat> some other talk. Okay, haughty means superior and disdainful, and these are the aspects of pride that we're going to be talking about. Now, as my source material, I'm going to call upon the two actual greatest talks on pride, at least the greatest talks that I know of. Um, in 1989, President Ezra Taft Benson gave a talk to his counselor, President Hinckley, and asked him to read it in general conference. That talk called Beware of Pride. The other talk is Pride in the Priesthood, given by then President Uchtdorf, who is a member of the First Presidency. Now, to help you understand what I'm doing with the slides, if you see President Benson in yellow, then that would mean that this slide is quoting President Benson. So I won't necessarily explicitly say that. I'm hoping you can pick it up visually. And if it's got President Uchtdorf in orange, then that would be a quote from President Uchtdorf. For example, quoting President Benson. President Benson says, pride is the universal sin, the great vice. Yes, pride is the universal sin, the great vice. It's kind of significant, I think, that he would bother to repeat it so that we wouldn't miss it. Pride is universal. It's everywhere, perhaps in everyone. In fact, he clarifies it this way. Pride affects all of us at various times and in various degrees. President Uchtdorf seconds that. Every mortal has had at least a casual, if not an intimate, relationship with the sin of pride. No one has avoided it, few overcome it. Which brings me to my first point. Just assume you have pride. It's universal, few overcome it. And don't even let yourself believe that otherwise. You're just on the safe side if you think I've got pride. It's something that I fight daily and on, and on an ongoing basis. You might be wrong, but you know what? That's a good kind of wrong. You were kind of okay with that, right? You don't want to be wrong the other way thinking you don't have pride when you very much do. In fact, I would say that the surest sign that a person is proud is that they think they're not because it's the universal sin. Okay, point number two. 
Other people can probably see our pride better than we can see our own pride. Pride is in our blind spot. We drive through our life like we do in our cars with blind spots that we have to deliberately check to make sure that we're driving safely. Pride is in that blind spot. We have a hard time seeing our own pride. It's kind of like trying to tickle ourselves. It just doesn't work, right? We have a hard time seeing our own pride. President Benson, pride is a sin that can readily be seen in others, but is rarely admitted in ourselves. Point number three, pride is contagious and persistent. It's like those dandelions. Have you ever worked really, really hard on your lawn and then noticed a neighbor has dandelions popping up? And it just makes you want to grow because you know it's just a matter of time before those invisible little weeds find seed in your carefully maintained lawn, right? Or maybe you're the one spreading the dandelions, I don't know. But pride is contagious. It is always trying to uh, take root and start to grow. Just because we're not planting those seeds, it has nothing to do with it. It's still trying to pop up in our characters on a daily basis. President Benson, we are tempted daily to elevate ourselves above others and to diminish them. Here's another point. Pride is a very misunderstood sin and many are sinning in ignorance. So we're innocently sinning with pride. It's not malicious. We're not trying to be bad people. It's just pride is stealthy and it's always trying to creep in on us. So in innocence, many of us are sinning with the sin of pride. Now, I want to make this point. Satan cannot destroy God's work. It's just not within his power to do it. But he can make it really hard for us to distinguish what is God's work from all the counterfeits that he can put out there that seem like they're good. For example, remember when God turned Aaron's rod into a serpent? Satan wasn't able to do anything about that. He couldn't undo the transformation to a serpent. However, Satan was able to create other serpents, to confuse Pharaoh as to what was godly power or not. Um, alternate serpents for Pharaoh to trust is a very major uh, way that um, Satan confuses us and keeps us away from pride and other gospel principles. So point number three, beware of the abundant misinformation that obfuscates the fundamental gospel principles. Any gospel principle that's out there, Satan will try to make it hard for us to actually understand it um, in every way. For example, faith. We are not victims of doubt. I work a lot with young single adults and I work at BYU and very often people act like they're victims of doubt, like it's just something that's happening to them. But in the lectures on faith, way back at the restoration of the church, it says, quote, faith is a choice. And then in 2017, Elder Anderson gave a talk that was called Faith is a Choice. Faith is a choice and doubt is a choice. It's not something that happens to us. It's a path that we choose. My camera was flashing at me. I wanted to make sure it didn't mean something bad was happening. <laughs> okay. We can also take a look at love. Yes, love is a feeling, but love isn't something necessarily that's passive and happens to us. Love is a promise. Every parent and grandparent knows this, right? I might not always like what you do right now, but you're always okay with me. Love is a promise. I'm just committed to love you. And because I've made this commitment, I generate within myself that feeling of love for others. Likewise, pride is not this excess of confidence. I think very often people think of this, con this continuum that has pride on one end and humility on the other, and maybe way out to arrogance, and, and we, we're just trying to keep ourselves. It's not actually how pride works. They're not actually related in that way. Nor is meekness timidity. Now, people are timid, and the, the symptoms for timidity, if you will, they very much look like humility, but they're not the same thing. It's just an external manifestation. Um, timidity is passive, and meekness is active. It's something we're working on every day. I think I have slides in here that talk more about timidity. I'm going to mention it now in case I don't. Timidity comes from a, a point of fear. 
like I'm afraid to do something, therefore I'm timid. Where humility comes from a point of, I'm trying to be like Jesus. So pride is a very misunderstood sin, and many are sinning in ignorance. Now, some things that we look at that we think are pride aren't necessarily pride. For example, knowing that you're good at something, that's not necessarily pride nor acknowledging your, comp your accomplishments. That's not necessarily a proud thing to do. And things that aren't necessarily humility are self-deprecation or putting yourself down, right? Boy, I'm not doing a very good job. Or the infamous, do these pants make my backside look fat? You know, sometimes, sometimes we're saying things to get and to solicit co compliments. Uh, here it is. Timidity has similar symptoms, but it's a very different cause. Okay, the central feature of pride, says President Benson, is enmity. Enmity toward God and enmity toward our fellow men. And he also says this, enmity means hostility to or a state of opposition. So the core of pride is hostility to or a state of opposition. He says pride is essentially competitive in nature. We pit our will against God's will. President Dorf seconds that at its core, pride is the sin of comparison. So if you grew up in European culture, or as you know, most Americans come from that, you're, you're familiar with the sociological hierarchy, right? Most countries have royals, and then they have a class of nobles, and nobles are very stratified. They're, they're duke and marquess and earl and vice count and baron and all these different levels. And it doesn't feel wrong because everybody grew up in a society that was very tiered like that. And even the commoners are very tiered. I don't know if you've watched a certain very popular television show whose uh, edifice is in the background of this, but um, we learn in that show that there's a butler and an under butler and a housekeeper and a head valet, and they're all very, very animate about what positions are above another. And this way of looking at society, it becomes like that smell in our house that we can't smell anymore because we're always in the house, but new people can come to that and, and go, whoa, what's with that smell? Um, and if, as if that wasn't weird enough, in these cultures, inside a family, sons can be ranked higher than daughters, and the oldest son above the other sons. Um, I say weird because as a Native American from Alaska, I come from a very flat society. You're either an elder or you're someone else. And guess what? Everybody gets to be an elder in my culture. You just have to live long enough, right? And then you get to, to move up into that extra stratosphere. And so it's a cultural thing. Um, and there are some Asian cultures that aren't so tiered as well. And they take a look at European and American culture and see it differently from us. But I bring that up because in our society, we, we're kind of like a constant differential engine. If I meet someone new, is he above me or below me? I once had a girl tell me, Tom, you don't understand. Every woman knows where the prettiest girl in the room is. I'm like, what? And she's like, yeah, they're all wanting to know where the competition is. And that's that's just outside of my scope of, of understanding. Um, but it's the comparison, says President Benson, that makes you proud. It's the pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition is gone, pride has gone. Quoting C.S. Lewis, in the pre-earthly pre council, Lucifer placed his proposal in competition to Father's plan. So competition is a very key element of pride. So let's do a quick pop quiz. I say, my lesson went really well. Is that pride or not pride? Not pride? Okay, why do you say not pride? You just got confidence in what you, what you did. I have confidence in what I did, she says, yes. And I haven't compared it to anything or anyone, right? Okay, so I've made a statement of fact. It's like, I paid 10% of my income, right? Is that pride or not pride? It's just a statement of fact. Okay, let's look at the next one. My lesson went better than Mr. Darcy's. Mm -hmm. Pride. And prejudice. <laughs> it's pride and prejudice. Okay, it's pride because now we're being comparative about an accomplishment, right? Okay, how about this one? 
my lesson wasn't as good as Elizabeth Bennett's. Is that pride or not pride? Okay, we have mixed answers in the room here. I don't know if you can hear that on the internet. The answer is it's still pride. Remember, President Benson, we're going to talk about this. He talks about pride from the bottom looking up. And that is still pride, like pride from the top looking down. So this would be an example of that. My, my lesson wasn't as good as, as Elizabeth Bennett's. Okay, how about this one? Everyone said my lesson was great. Pride or not pride? Okay, we, okay, we have some pride and we have some head shakes saying not pride. I will say that this was a trick uh, question in our quiz because it could go either way. It just depends on the motives. For example, I could look at my sleep tracker and say, I slept three hours and 25 minutes last night. I had one heck of a work day today and everyone said my lesson was great. You know, that could just be a, le that could be a statement of astonishment, right? Or even in glorifying God, like, wow, the only way that could happen was because the Spirit compensated for all my weaknesses, right? So that would not be, but it could also be, everyone said my lesson was great. I didn't say my lesson was great, mind you, but everyone said it was great, right? That false humility that sometimes some of us can put on, then in that case, that would be a statement of pride. So that begs the question, what is humility specifically? Now, I have to tell a quick story. My mission kind of had two phases to it and they alternated a little bit. Sometimes I was a really good missionary, I had a lot of success, and sometimes I struggled wondering if I should even be out there. And the big reason why that was, was I struggled with this pride humility thing, because I'm, I'm a Lamanite, I'm, I'm Native American, I'm from the Clinkett tribe of Southeast Alaska, but in Southern California, I looked Hispanic, that was just the assumption, and I went on a Spanish-speaking mission to LA, right? And I learned the language fairly quickly, and I'm a former Catholic altar boy, so I understood some of the culture and where they're all coming from, and I think these gave me advantages as a missionary. But when I started thinking, Tom, you're a pretty good missionary, I started feeling like, I'm proud. And so I like, you can't tell yourself, you can't tell yourself that. So then I, I try to bring myself down a path that I thought was humility and I'd feel terrible about myself. And I'd look at all these lifetime members of the church and I'm like, why am I out here? And I, they had all these family home evenings and seminary and all this preparation. And maybe I shouldn't even be out here. And, uh, but in those eras, I also wasn't baptizing many people. So finally in my mission, I said, I don't, I don't have an answer to this pride humility thing. I'm going to worry about it when I get off my mission because at least when I think I'm a good missionary, I'm doing some good while I'm out here and some other people are going to benefit from that. So not long after my mission, this statement was said by President Monson. And when I researched it, I found it was also said by James E. Talmadge and both in a general conference. And this is the single most helpful line that I've ever seen on helping me understand humility. In fact, if this line is the only thing you remember from from this talk tonight, then you need to pay better attention. <clears throat> okay, they said, gratitude is the twin sister to humility. And I just love that. So if I can be grateful when good things are happening or even when hard times are, then I feel like I'm at least within shouting distance of humility. To find gratitude in whatever I'm going through, then maybe I'm approximating or getting close to what humility is. President Uchtdorf, we can be grateful for our health, for our wealth. If we're grateful for wealth, is that pride? Doesn't seem like it. Our possessions or positions. But when we focus on our own importance, power, or reputation, when we dwell upon our public image, that's when pride starts to corrupt. So being grateful for those things, not pride. Letting it be a basis of comparison for how we're doing compared to others, then we're beginning to corrupt. So this is Elder Worthland. He was the president of BYU, recently released, and he's a General Authority 70. He gave a talk not long ago, and he talked on humility, and I definitely recommend that you look for this talk. I don't focus on it too much here because I wanted to use President Uchtdorf from President um, Benson, but he had this, which I think was really important. Humility is studied in academic literature. So what do academics think 
humility is. Completely uh, separate and divorced from the gospel. Number one, it's an accurate assessment of oneself. Number two, it's the acknowledgement of one's mistakes and limitations. Number three, it's an openness to other viewpoints and ideas. Number four, keeping one's accomplishments and abilities in perspective. Number five, I think this is an interesting one, low self-focus. You're just not really worrying about yourself. I remember when I first got off my mission, I went to Juneau, Alaska, and um, I'd just visit with people, and they'd say, Tom, how are you doing? And I'd just say, I don't know. They'd go, how can you not know how are you doing? And I would say, I just figure happiness is like baking a cake. And if you're opening the door all the time to check if you're happy, you're actually destroying the possibility that your cake is going to come out okay. So I just assume everything's okay and I'm happy and I just push right on through. A low self-focus. Number six, appreciating the value of others. Again, academia says this is what humility is. So present worth and then maps each of these um, academic principles over to gospel principles, divine potential. Oh, that's kind of covered on my screen, so I'll have to look this way. He says in that talk, humility does not mean we should denigrate or underestimate our abilities. If we undervalue our abilities and gifts, we will not be humble because we will not be accurately assessing ourselves, which is the first characteristic of humility. So you can actually be a humble person by acknowledging what you're very good at. Does that make sense? Is everyone comfortable with that? Okay. Um, Sister Joy D. Jones, the general primary president, had a statement that kind of reaffirms that. Satan is the father of all lies, especially when it comes to misrepresentations about our own divine nature and purpose. Thinking small about ourselves does not serve us well. Instead, it holds us back. And that's what I was discovering as a missionary when I thought small of myself it was holding me back, and it, was, it had this collateral damage of other converts. Okay, President Uchtdorf. Suppose Some suppose that humility is about beating ourselves up. Humility does not mean convincing ourselves that we are worthless, meaningless, or of little value. Nor does it mean denying or withholding the talents that God has given us. So we can be comfortable with our accomplishments and our talents and our abilities and not worry that we've crossed a line into pride. Despite his magnificent abilities and accomplishments, the Savior was always meek and humble. What an amazing statement. Can you think, obviously, no one has done more for the good of mankind than the Savior of mankind. He had the ultimate accomplishments of everybody who ever walked the earth, and yet he was able to be meek and humble every step of that journey. So, President Worth and Maps repentance to the acknowledgement of one's mistakes and limitations. And then revelation, being open to other viewpoints and ideas. I have a friend back in Orem named Jean Ann Hutching. She's an amazing woman, and she's also a very political person. And I mention that because when the vaccines for COVID-19 came out, her pundits said that they were really bad and they should be avoided. So she made up her mind that's what she's doing. So I went over to her house one day to help her with something, and when I did, I noticed a little bandage on her shoulder. And I was like, Jean-Ann, is everything okay? Are you hurt? And she said, I got vaccinated. And I had a bad reaction. I said, I admit I'm shocked. And she scolded me. She said, you think I wouldn't follow the prophet? And I was like, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, and everything. I was so impressed with her humility. For her, prophets, I mean, pundits and experts had their place. But for her, prophets would always be above them. And I don't mean this to be a statement about anything except allowing ourselves to be open to revelation. Dependence on God, keeping one's accomplishments in line. Now, this is something I've often thought, and you're going to think about some Book of Mormon scriptures maybe as I go through this, but how can we actually justify being proud? Whenever we accomplish something, we've done it using the gifts that God gave us. 
We did it leveraging the life experience that God has given us, including where we were born, who our parents were, how our family was, whether or not we had access to education, which is the next one. We've taken advantage of the education that God blessed us to obtain. And we're very often guided, even without our knowledge, by the Holy Ghost and God who put people in our pathway or thoughts into our hearts and mind. No matter how you look at it, our achievements and abilities or because of God's hand in our lives. So make no mistake, no matter how capable you are, we are very much dependent upon God. Okay, so service to others, um, a low self-focus. Um, I apologize for not being familiar enough with my slides. I, uh, anyway, I just apologize. I had a busy run up to this, so I might be out of order with this. Let me peek ahead. Yeah, okay, I must be talking about that later. So when we are giving service to others, we have this low self-focus. And by making sure we're in an attitude of service and an activity of service, we're doing a lot to assure that we're not um, suffering from, from pride. This statement, if you remember nothing from tonight, remember this statement. <laughs> We don't discover humility by thinking less of ourselves. We discover humility by thinking less about ourselves. So number six, gratitude and charity. That's how we appreciate um, the value of others. So President Benson says this, our motives for the things we do are where the sin of pride is manifest. So pride is manifested in our motives. And that's tricky because I can't see your motives. I can only see your behavior and hear your words. I can't see your motives. That's blind to me. We're kind of the only ones that are completely aware of our motives. And it's our motives is where pride is manifest. Apparently, I have a blank white slide. Oh, and this is why. So I want to talk quickly about, I think my uh, my my export of my slides and import into the software here didn't go smoothly, but I'll do my best to work around it. So as we all know, there are three kingdoms of glory that await us. Um, the celestial kingdom, the terrestrial kingdom, and the celestial kingdom. And to make it easy for me, I just give them color codes. We have blue, we have green, we have red. And the reason I chose those colors is because everything we see on a TV screen or a computer screen is a blend of blue, red, or green. So all those other colors, everything that we're seeing on the screens, that's why they sometimes call the screens RGB for red, green, blue. So when we blend these three motives, that's all the behavior that we're seeing in our lives. So blue being celestial motives and green being um, terrestrial. And these are, the, I think, the three, in its simplest way, the three basic motives that we have for everything that we do. Um, of course, there are sons of perdition, but I don't know any and neither do you. So most everything we see, most everything we do are our celestial motives, blue or green or red. Okay, and there's some more color to help us out with that. Okay, so let's take a look at this from the vantage point of temptations. Now you remember that when Christ fasted for 40 days, he was tempted by Satan. The first temptation was what? Turn stones to bread or please yourself. Tell you, after 40 days of not eating, that was probably tempting for anybody, right? In case, so that's the red motive. Then he went, Satan went to the next temptation level, the green level. He brought Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and said, leap from it because it is written that the angels will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. So at this point, Jesus had yet to preach a sermon. He had yet to make his ministry public. Can you imagine the Messiah the temple being the center of Jerusalem, floating down from the top of the temple and then into Jerusalem. What a crowd pleaser that would have been, right? But Jesus didn't succumb to that temptation. And then Satan took him to the top of a high mountain and said, fall down and worship me or please Satan. So if we look at the three kingdoms, they kind of map to three temptations in kind of an interesting way. So now let's look at the two great commandments. Why do we look at the two great commandments? Because President Nukdorf said this, when our hearts are filled with pride, we commit a grave sin, for we violate the two great commandments. So when we're proud, we're violating two great commandments. The first great commandment is, of course, to love God. 
The second is to love our neighbor. And I will say that there's not actually a commandment in this to love ourselves, right? In fact, I've never found a scripture that says love yourself, but we all understand, and there are plenty of conference talks that talk about self-care, about caring for ourselves so that we can do these other things. But it's a scary thing. You may remember this scripture, 2 Timothy 3. This know that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, having a form of godliness. They look like they're good. They look like they're godly. They look like they're churchy, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So I have that caution about loving yourself. For me, I think about caring for myself and loving God and loving my neighbor. Okay, President Uchtdorf. The goal is to learn to love God and to that extent, that same love toward our fellow man. So this three by three matrix is kind of the way I look at pride. President Benson, if we love God, do his will and fear his judgment more than men's, we shall have self-esteem. Now that's kind of tricky because I think a lot of people think you get self-esteem by loving yourself and caring for yourself and telling yourself, you know, that you're good or you're special or something like that. But according to President Benson, when we're loving God, we're getting self-esteem as a byproduct of that. The proud depend upon the world to tell them whether they have value or not. Their self-esteem is determined by where they are judged to be on the ladder of worldly success. Okay, if you ask any primary child what the symbol of love is, they'll say a heart, especially around Valentine's Day, right? And I think the heart is an interesting symbol. And I know I have a medical doctor here in our audience, um, so he can correct me if I'm wrong, but I cannot think of another major muscle in our body that, that is strengthened in the way that the heart is. You see, if I want to strengthen my bicep, I isolate that muscle and I give it resistance and then it breaks it down, and then it grows back stronger. If I want to strengthen my legs, I do the same thing. But if I want to strengthen my heart, I can't flex it. I can't isolate it and, and flex my heart to make it stronger. The way our hearts are made strong is by focusing on every other major muscle group. When we strengthen every other major muscle, that process as a byproduct strengthens our heart. And I think that is a beautiful symbol for pride, for humility, and for love. As we focus on strengthening others, we strengthen ourselves as a byproduct. And that's why self-esteem comes from serving others and from loving God and being obedient. It's what, um, it's what we read in the New Testament. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. It's one of the most beautiful gospel paradoxes and principles, in my opinion. Okay. I don't know why I kept putting this slide in there. Oh, so the green zone and the red zone, that's the pride zone. And we're trying to live with our motives mostly in blue, our motives, right? Um, the celestial kingdom, as you can see up there in the top right, that's kind of the motive of thy will be done. And the people who live blue lives, they go through it, right? They have temptations, they have adversities, they have things happen to them that are not really just. Sometimes they're angry, sometimes they're frustrated, they repent, and they try to think celestial and bring themselves back up to the blue zone. Okay, terrestrial is their will be done. I've got to do this to be seen of others, right? Or, and then, um, oh yeah, James 4.4. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? I love that that word is used, enmity being the core uh, foundation for pride. Okay. The proud stand more in fear of men's judgment than of God's judgment. What will men think of me weighs heavier than what will God think of me? So it's the there will be done green level. Okay. So now we look at the red level. My will be done my selfish desires. The carnal mind is enmity against God. There's that word again. So we look at those levels. Selfishness is one of the more common faces of pride. How everything affects me is the center of all that matters. 
When we direct our pride toward God, it is in the spirit of my will, not thine be done. Okay, pride zone again, in case you didn't get that the first time. Okay, Pre President Uchtdorf. In fact, it could be said that every other sin is, in essence, a manifestation of pride. It's the green and the red. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about how that works in a practical way in the real world, right? We've been very esoteric and theoretical about all this. So I walk five miles a day in the mornings through our neighborhoods, throughout our stake. And in the process of doing that, I bump into new people, make new friends. And one of those times I bumped into an elderly woman who wasn't in my ward and she was trying to move her food storage. And she wanted to move from the mid-level down to the bottom level. And her garage door was open and I saw these great big sacks in her car. This is, these aren't her sacks. So I'm thinking, service, right? I can do this. So I veer off, pause my watch so that, you know, it doesn't ask, am I still working out? And I ask if I can help. Now, I grab one of these bags and I head downstairs to where it is that she wants me to do it. She's got a granddaughter helping her, about 17 years old, right? A fit young person. Now I have to pause and say this, before I can give service now, I mean, it used to be that I'd just check my schedule. Yeah, I can fit it in. You know, now I have to check my lower back, my rotator cuff, you know, my my various sports injuries and everything like that to kind of assess whether or not I can do this and everything. I'm thinking, yeah, I can give this service. So um, I grab one of these heavy sacks and I bring it from the mid-level down to the new space where she's storing her food storage and I put it on the stack of things. Now, as I'm walking back up the stairs, the 17-year-old girl is walking down the stairs with two sacks <laughs> and she didn't know and she did it but as she passed me on the stairs she hit me right in the male ego <laughs> so i was very blue you know when i started this whole thing like oh i'm going to go do some service and help out with all this and everything but as i'm walking up the stairs i'm suddenly sliding into the green zone you know, because now I'm, I'm comparing myself and my abilities with this young person and everything. And, and I'm thinking, okay, what do I have later today? I had an interpreter foundation thing where I'm setting up tables and chairs and I can't hurt my back on this and I can't do this and everything. But I can't also just let her do two without me doing two as well, right? So I'm struggling with this whole thing inside of me. Can anyone want to guess what I did when I got to the stack of bags? <laughs> two. I grabbed two. No, it wasn't three. That would have been, yeah, that would have been definitely a rational escalation in this. So I'm heading down the stairs now with one bag on one shoulder and one bag on the other shoulder. And I am really questioning this whole thing, right? And I'm huffing and I'm puffing and going down the stairs. And this young woman's walking up the stairs. And she goes, nice. And then she walks past me. <laughs> now, I know she said nice, but to me, it sounded like, not bad for an old guy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and everything. <laughs> and so I, I point this out because we don't just live in a blue zone or a green zone or a red zone, and we can't just categorize people as red, green, or blue, right? Because we're kind of moving inside and outside. Nobody can even see it. It's swimming inside of us with our motives. That's why I really love, just to put in another plug for it, President Nelson's Think Celestial. Now, I've also heard a lot of people saying it should be think celestially, it's an adverb and everything. I, I would like to point this out that he is a doctor, he is a brilliant person, he's very well educated, and by the way, this is the prophet that's worried about our words to the point that he's asked us to not refer to ourselves as Mormon or LDS. I don't think it's an accident, it's think celestial. In fact, if you want, you can say think celestial, like a word in quotes, like think blue right? Think blue, think into that stratosphere and not one of these other levels. So at any rate, um, that's kind of how red, green, and blue can kind of appear to us um, in, in the real world. And we have a blank white slide. I wonder what was supposed to be there. Okay, we can see behaviors, but we can't see motives. Now that means we have to be really careful about how we judge others. So let's take a look at the good behavior of a really good family. How do they do that, right? Well, it could be that the parents are teaching their kids, kids, you have to be good because, and here's the blue motive, because we love God. We're so grateful for everything that he's doing in our lives, and we're grateful to him. So let's show our gratitude by being good people in return, by being obedient. Now, the green level might look like this. Kids, we have to be good because dad is a bishop, 
and we have to be a good example. People are watching us. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a good example. I hope we all want to be a good example. But if it's our primary motive, then we're actually doing the right thing for a green reason, right? Now, the third level. Kids, you need to be good because I can ground you for a week, right? We're going to set out that fear. It's in your best self-interest to do this. I have a friend. She's really funny. She tells her kids in jest, I can replace you in nine months. <laughs> 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 but, um, but we can't see the motives on the outside. All we can see are behaviors. And so what I would say is don't worry about the pride of anyone else. Don't worry about their motives. What are the odds that we're actually going to get it right anyway? So let's just be concerned about those weeds that keep popping up inside ourselves because the same behavior can be motivated by really different motives. I love this scripture. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. In fact, I would say that's kind of the primary function of pride is to deceive us, to make us think that we're living in a reality which not, might not actually be connected with the larger reality, especially a gospel reality. President Benson, most of us consider pride to be a sin of those on the top. However, there is a far more common ailment about this. And I really want to emphasize it. Yes, people on the top looking down at us is pride, but it's a lot more common for those of us on the bottom to be looking at others with pride. It's a far more common ailment. And that is the pride, the sin of pride from the bottom looking up. So let's talk a little bit about that. The sin of pride from the bottom looking up is manifest in so many ways, such as fault finding. Fault finding is pride? Well, yeah, we're trying to bring someone else down to our level or below us. When we're seeing and dwelling on the faults of others, you know you're struggling with pride. That's in your blind spot. Gossiping, it's kind of the same problem, right? Oh, that person. Backbiting, murmuring. Oh my goodness, complaining about things. I was struggling with complaining about my lack of preparation time coming in. Murmuring would be a manifestation of my pride. Living beyond our means, right? We're trying to make everyone think we're maybe more fluent than we actually are. Envying, coveting, withholding gratitude and praise that might lift another. Isn't that interesting? That if you withhold gratitude and praise from someone that could lift someone, that means that you're proud. So I expect everyone to come up after and tell me what a good job I did. <laughs> or else I'll know. <clears throat> yes, I'm joking. Completely yeah, joking. Say, I did great. <laughs> I say, everyone, told me. everyone told me I did great. I'm not saying I did. <laughs> okay. So while we're on the subject of gratitude, I want to express gratitude for Diane for letting me be on the roster with the actual people that people would pay to go see. And for just the good that she's been doing in this whole series and for others, connecting people in places with, with uh, people who are spiritual giants and who influence them while they're doing it. Thank you. I also want to immortalize these two women because Maddie Hershey and Sarah Lab are responsible for the success of everything that happens, but it's behind the scenes. Um, Maddie sets everything up, runs the, the payments of everything. Sarah has set up this room, you know, so that we can all be meeting here. And they're really good people. They're really a joy to work with. They're just such good people. So I want to thank them when we're here. So pride from the bottom looking up, being unforgiving. When we decide to not forgive someone, even if they're not deserving, or even if, you know, we don't, that is actually our pride. The pride are easily offended and hold grudges. They withhold forgiveness to keep another in their debt and to justify their injured feelings. So on my mission, I had this missionary companion who had a difficult time getting along with a lot of elders. And I got called into the mission office and president said, we're going to give you this elder. And then he said this, if he doesn't get along with you, I'm going to send him home. And it's like he just threw two big bags of weed on my shoulders. And I know what that feels like. I was like, what? And so I'm trying my best to get along with him. But he was a very, very difficult person. And one day we had baptisms and we were headed to our baptisms. That's like the pinnacle of missionary work, right? And he said, I'm just not up to it. I'm going to go take a nap. 
And he took off his tie, took off his shirt, and he went into the bedroom. And I was really frustrated with him. I was so frustrated. And so I tried to talk with him. He wasn't doing it. So I called the ward mission leader. I'm sorry, we're not going to be there. Elder, how can you not be there? I'm sorry, but we can't be there. Um, this is who's supposed to give prayers. Can you have so-and-so do this and everything? Making the arrangements like this. And I'm starting to get really angry. And I sit in this chair, and I'm reading my scriptures. Oh, I missed the important part. I'm frustrated, and he can see I'm frustrated. And he said this, and you have to forgive me or you're guilty of the greater sin. And then he went into the room and took his nap. And I'm, I'm a member of the church about three and a half years at this point, right? And everything. And so I, I sit down with my doctor and covenants and I'm reading and reading. And my eyes are reading over words, but not one of them's coming into me. You know, I'm just, I can't believe he's doing this, you know, and everything. Maybe he should be sent home, you know, all this stuff. He can't say I'm guilty of the greater sin. I'm the good missionary here. He's not. And all this stuff is just churning inside of me. But from the outside, I'm reading my scriptures, right? We can't know people's motives. And I'm thinking, is that really what it says? And so I flip to that spot in the Doctrine and Covenants, and I'm, yeah, it says that. I read the part above, read the part above. Is there, are there any exceptions, any exemptions to this rule? And I thought, you know what? I'm guilty of the greater sin. I am guilty of the greater sin if I can't forgive him. And so I started wrestling with this while he was taking his nap inside praying with God, trying to work this all out in my mind. And by the time he woke up and he came out, I was a different Elder Pittman. And I apologized to him. And he looked at me kind of warily. I said, I'm just, I'm really sorry. Um, it's probably hard for you to be my companion because I'm a convert to the church, I'm gung-ho. I just want everyone to come into this gospel. I want to work on P-Days. I just didn't find many companions who would let me do that. And my poor companion, um, he was the youngest of three brothers, if I'm remembering right, and his two older brothers were both assistants to the president. And now he's out on his mission thinking, I can never live up to that legacy. What's the family going to think of me? You know, all this kind of pressure. So I think he just wasn't even trying. And I said, I just haven't been understanding of what the mission is for you and how hard it must be for you to be out here and not at college because he's also struggling with his testimony. But he was still there, right? He was still there. He was still giving it his go. And I said, I promise I'll try a lot harder to be a good companion for you and we'll figure this out between us. And to this day, we're still friends. We're Facebook friends. Um, but I have to tell you, I was guilty of the greater sin. I couldn't see it, and I couldn't see it until the Spirit worked with me about it. We have to forgive. The proud do not receive counsel or correction easily. And that's a shame because we actually can't repent if we can't receive counsel or correction easily. Another face of pride is contention. And um, I think it's interesting that both President Benson and President Uchtdorf quoted this scripture in their talks. Only by pride cometh contention. I hate that. That's another one of those where I look for, that's the worst scripture in the standard works, I'm sorry. But only by pride come with contention. So when I find myself in a contentious situation, I have to ask, Lord, is it I? How am I contributing to this contention that we have? Am I saying all contention is two-way pride? No. Um, the Pharisees and Sadducees came at Jesus a lot with contention. There's no way I'm going to say that that was a two-way pride problem, right? But for those of us who are not Jesus, we have to think that we're contributing to the contention with our pride. Pride is sinful because it breeds hatred or hostility, and it places us in opposition to God and our fellow men. Unity is impossible for a proud people, and unless we are one, we're not the Lord's. So ask when you find yourself, Lord, is it I? I've adopted this as one of my main policies for my life. I apologize because I was wrong, but I also apologize because I value our relationship more than my pride. In fact, I have to admit, in most circumstances, I don't even care who's right or wrong. I don't care. If you're someone who means something to me and our relationship is in danger, I'm apologizing. I'm just doing it because my pride does not mean as much to me as our relationship does. Our degree of pride determines how we treat our brothers and sisters. 
So how we treat others is a manifestation of the amount of pride that we have. And that's a scary thought because some people will look at groups of people and look at them with disdain, right? If they're not part of our political group, if they're not part of our ethnic group or part of our culture or our country, by default, we may just look at them differently from ourselves. Think about the persons you love the least. Maybe someone who's wronged you or someone who's got uh, differences of opinion with you. That's how much you love God. We love God as much as the person we love the least. Because in as much as we do it unto the least of these, we have done it unto our Savior. The proud are not easily taught. They won't change their minds to accept truth because to do so implies that they've been wrong. Okay, President Uchtdorf has this really great statement that he made. He said, there is an embarrassing lack of civility and intolerance and hatred for the opposing side. Anyway, he made this statement about sports, but he said the same thing applies to politics, ethnicity, and religion. So since the same thing apologizes to them, I've set up this up as tabs so that we can look at these points in every one of these. So let's look at sports. Is there an embarrassing lack of civility in sports? Has anyone been to a BYU Utah game? <laughs> you know, okay. Is there intolerance and hatred, hatred for the opposing side? Not just the team, but their fans. In sports, do people look for any flaw and magnify it? Do they make broad generalizations about their sports opponents? Do they rejoice when ill fortune afflicts the rival, say a key injury? So let's take a look at these same bullet points with politics as the context. Is there an embarrassing lack of civility in politics? There sure is in our country, right? Um, is there intolerance and hatred for the opposing side? Sadly, it's become the default now for politics on a national level. Do we look for any flaw in our political opposites and magnify it? Do we make broad generalizations about others? Some of these broad generalizations are uh, derogatory terms that we have for them, right? We'll make up words for someone and call them certain names, their group. Do we rejoice when ill fortune afflicts our rival in a political arena? So look at ethnicity. Is there embarrassing lack of civility in ethnic groups? Today being an interesting day for that, right? It's Columbus Day for some people, and I'm wearing my Native American tribal tie here, or it's Indigenous Day, right? For others on the same day, co-opting the very same day. Is there a lack of civility? Is there intolerance or hatred for the opposing side? Do we look for flaws and magnify them? Do we make broad generalizations about others? Do we rejoice when ill fortune afflicts them? And then religion, is there an embarrassing lack of civility? I know people who when there's a mass shooting, they look at the articles to see what the religion of the mass shooter was, right? Or even the politics. Is this someone from the far right? Is this someone who's a Muslim or something like that? Um, intolerance and hatred for the opposing side. Heck, I see that inside our church. I work with the youth a lot, and there are youth that call one of the wards in our stake the rich ward, and they don't like them. The richies, they're all stuck up, okay? Um, do we look for any flaw and magnify it in religion? Do we make broad generalizations about others? I guarantee you will never hear in general conference a speaker refer to people who have left our faith as exmos. They'll never do it because it's a derogatory term. It's a judgment about someone else. And they're living more blue than some of us do. Do, do they rejoice when ill fortune affects their rival? Okay. They seek to hurt, diminish, or tear down others in a misguided and unworthy attempt at self-elevation. If I bring you down, that's another way of saying I'm above you. Pride is the great stumbling block to Zion. I want to point that out. We're not talking about the world in general with these talks. He's talking about us. I repeat, pride is the great stumbling block to Zion to be active members of the church. In fact, and it was uh, Jared Halverson who said this. He said, if the Apostle Paul were alive today, Utah would be getting a letter. 
I love that. The epistle of Paul to the Oramites. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Okay. Should we not hold ourselves to a higher standard? Would we not do well to have the pleasing of God as our motive rather than to try to elevate ourselves above our brother and outdo another? All of God's children wear the same jersey. Our team is the brotherhood of man. If this is the only thing that you remember from my talk this day, <laughs> that might be it. President Benson, we can choose to humble ourselves by conquering enmity toward our brothers and sisters, esteeming them as ourselves, lifting them as high or higher than we are. Now, this week I got to meet one of my heroes, George Durant. Um, I got off my mission. I'm going to tell the story. It's a weird story. If you know me, I've got a lot of weird stories. I had a weird life. But I got off my mission and I gave a talk. And after the mission, this couple came up to me and said, you remind us of George Durant. I'm like, who's that? I'm like, you don't know who George Durant is? So they lent me some talk tapes. And I was like, no, I don't remember, mind anyone of George Durant. But he was just amazing. I mean, the way he spoke and the way he talked and the way he lifted others was just so inspiring. I really, really liked that. And then um, just by chance, I got invited to a very small dinner party where he was there. And I was just in awe of him. I was just, remember I showed you those stratified where Native Americans, we don't, that time he was way above. I, I didn't even know what to say at that dinner. And I would watch how he'd look at people and I'd watch how he'd notice people and I'd watch how he'd bring people out and everything. And I really wanted to be a person that lifted people higher than me. When pride has hold of our hearts, we lose our independence of the world and deliver our freedoms to the bondage of men's judgment. When we're worrying about what others think, we're bonding ourselves or putting ourselves in bondage. I'd never thought of it that way, but it's true. And then if they change how they feel, we have to change ourselves to remain in favor with them. We're definitely in bondage. God will have a humble people. We can choose to be humble or we can be compelled to be humble. And I've been compelled to be humble more times than I want to admit. We can choose to humble ourselves to President Benson by receiving counsel and chastisement, by forgiving those who have offended us, even if we think they don't deserve that or they've done nothing to earn it, by rendering selfless service, by getting to the temple more frequently, by confessing and forsaking our sins. Meekness, says President Uchtdorf, means that we give all glory to the Father, just as the Savior did. It means that we lose ourselves in the service of others, just as the Savior did. The moment we stop obsessing with ourselves and lose ourselves in service, our pride diminishes and begins to die. There are so many people in need whom we could be thinking about instead of ourselves. I recently found out that there's someone in my home ward that um, was going through something. And I felt so ashamed because he was a good friend and he hadn't been talking to me for a week or two. And I judged it as, well, he doesn't like me. He's not, I've fallen out of favor with him. And as I'm thinking about myself, woe is me. I'm missing the opportunity to help a poor guy that was going through something. There's so many people in need. None is acceptable before God, save the meek and lowly in heart. You know, if I were to pass away or move away, I wonder how people would remember Tom. Was he that Native American guy? Was he that computer tech guy? You know, how do they think of me? And if in their conversation they're not saying he was meek and lowly of heart, maybe I blew it. Because I'm trying to be like Jesus with all my heart. And that's who he is. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Okay, I just gave away a punchline. So in conclusion, <laughs> if you've ever been fired from a construction job because of your appearance, <laughs> you might be a redneck. <laughs> what was the next one? If most of your wardrobe has logos on it, you might be a redneck. You might be a redneck if you have ever climbed a water tower with a bucket of paint to defend your sister's honor. 
<laughs> and you know what? If you are a redneck, I'm sure Heavenly Father is okay with that. I just wonder if he's okay with us being stiff necks. The world shouts louder than the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. So we have to calm ourselves in order to be able to hear it. And sometimes that means stepping away from devices and music and all that so that we can be in a position where they can hear it. Okay, this is my concluding story. Those are three of my children. In this story, I call the bigger half story. So one day I came home from work, was tired, it was too late to make a meal, so I took us to our favorite sandwich shop in Eagle River, Alaska. And as everyone was ordering, all the kids were kind of struggling, should I get this, should I get that? And someone had the idea, let's just order differently, and when we get home, exchange halves with someone else. We can trade the half sandwiches, and then we can have this one, which you like, but also this one. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. So we get our sandwiches, we get back to the house, we trade off all the halves, and we're sitting at the dining room table, and I turn to my oldest daughter, Jessica, I say, Jessica, will you give the prayer? And unlike her dad, she's not an emotional person, but she was struggling with tears. And it kind of humbled us all, so we're all just kind of quiet. And she said, I love you guys. And my sons go, we love you too, Jess. You know, what's happening? We don't know. And uh, so she says the prayer, and we start in our food, and we're having our conversation. And when she's past her emotions, I said, Jess, out of curiosity, um, was something happening before the prayer? And she said this, now I'm going to get emotional. She said, I looked at all of you, and every one of you gave away the bigger half. You didn't keep it for yourself. And the thing is, if you're in a family, a culture, a group, if we're in a group of godly people, giving away the bigger half means we're receiving the bigger half from someone else. It's how Zion works. It's what a Zion society is. You know, sometimes the dad can say, I'm the dad, I'm the biggest, so I should have the biggest piece of pizza, right? And when we model that kind of thinking, the red thinking or the green thinking, it inspires others to act the same, and they're rushing to grab theirs too. And it's a completely different culture in that way. Pride fades our feelings. It fades our feelings of sonship to God. It makes it so that we're less connected to our Heavenly Father and the brotherhood to man. It makes it so that I don't see you anymore as my brother or my sister on a common journey. I see you as one of these labels that we give ourselves. It separates us and divides us. That's what pride does to us. Thanks for listening. I don't even know how to end. <laughs> I think that would be good. Yes, sorry. Let me take care of some tech for you. I said thanks for listening, but let me also say this. In the name of Jesus Christ and with all gratitude for him. Amen. Amen. so grateful to be here this night to be able to share our thoughts with Brother Pittman. We're so grateful that he is able to instruct us in the fallacies of pride. Please help us to go home and be able to share with our families what we've learned. Help us to be humble. Help us to be able to not look up on others as well as look down on those um, who might also be around us. We are grateful, Lord, that we are servants in these latter days. We ask you to please help us to be able to always remember thee. We ask you to help us to be as Christ is. Help us to be able to think of others before ourselves and help us to serve in thy church in all of our days and all of our hours. We say this name in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Well, that was good.